Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father, that we can trust in it. And Lord, that you have us in the palm of your hand. Lord, you, you know everything about us. And you love us so much, you sent us your only son to die on a cross, which we will celebrate his resurrection next coming Sunday. Lord, we thank you, Father, for that resurrection. And because of that, we have a relationship with you that is real, it's alive, it's vital in our life. And we, we thank you that you have given us life. And help us to take in all that we can now from your word as we look at spiritual warfare, what the Apostle Paul was teaching on in Ephesians chapter 6, and throughout all the New Testament, Father, and the Old Testament, Lord, teaching us that denying evil and trusting in you, the God of the universe, who is holy, holy, holy. And we thank you that you are, and that you are perfect, and you are a loving, caring God, but also a just God, and a perfect God in everything that you do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, if you went home and you did your test, yes? Uh, I think they're all gone. What? Yeah, how many, how many people don't have them? One, two, three, four, five. Maybe get like six or seven copies if you can. Yeah, I told her to make more, but apparently it wasn't enough. So, But anyway, so if you, if you did your test at home, we're going to go through that real quick and uh, see how you did. Um, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because we've got a lot to cover with the other one, but we'll just go through this real quickly here. So the quiz, the last one here, final exam. We'll start from the top. It says um, A is 6, B is 10, C is 12, D is 7, E is 2, F is 9, G is 14, H is 3, I is 1, J is 5, K is 8, L is 11, M is 13, and O is 4. And 14, of course, was Jesus will appear visibly and physically. And then the true and false, again, if you get the false one and you make it true, changing the statement, then uh, you get extra bonus points for that. So, true or false? Okay, here we go. A is true, B is false, and to make that true, you would cross out lakes and rivers. It only talks about the sea. Uh, C is false. If you take out revelation of Jesus Christ and put in rapture, that is the rapture when Jesus comes for the saints. Comes for the saints. D is F. And if you take out the word often and put never, Jesus never taught about hell to unbelievers to convince them to turn to God. He talked about sin, but he always talked about heaven with, with unbelievers. So look that up in your scripture. It's very interesting. F, uh, or I mean E is false. If you take out universal and put in purgatory, purgatory teaches that there's a place of purification prior to entering heaven. And uh, that, that is taught in Catholicism, but um, it's not in the Bible, actually. So um, F is true. G is true. H is true. I is false. And if you take out believers and leave unbelievers. That's the great white throne of judgment. That's for unbelievers, not for believers. J is true. K is true. L is true. M is false. If you leave, uh, take out uh, the un and just leave believers, that would make it correct. So, O is true. P is false. There are two births, not three, required to enter the kingdom of heaven. You have your physical birth and you have your spiritual birth. Okay, born again. Q is false. And if you take out the 12 and replace it with 8, it was mentioned 8 times more than his first coming. R is false. And if you change paradise to Hades, that is the present place for unbelievers right now. According to scripture. S is true. T is true. U is false. Take out Sheol and put in paradise. That's the present of abode for believers. Presence of God. Being in the presence of God. And V is true. Okay, on to multiple choice then. How'd you all do so far? Hmm, pretty good. Okay, so which of the following are not found in heaven? A is all the above. All the above. Not found in heaven. 
Okay, not found in hell. Again, all the above. All the above. Um, and in heaven we will, that would be five, one and three, be, re, be reunited with loved ones and enjoy fellowship with people. We're not going to float on a cloud and play, a, play the harp. Um, D is uh, um, all the above. That's all the above for that one. And E is, again, all uh, above. Oh, no, one, one, two, three, and four, I'm sorry, above. So that's for E. F is um, one, two, three, and five above. So Tiger Woods is not in there. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the other ones are fill in the blank, and you had some of the words were down at the bottom. It's almost like a crossword puzzle. But uh, the origin, um, look at Son of Man first. Christ from above, place, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Uh, character, he humbles himself. Um, reception, he was despised. Mandate, he came to save in his destiny, heaven. And for Satan, it's he was from below. Uh, he's the Antichrist, the second person of the counterfeit Trinity. Um, Antichrist exalts himself. Antichrist is worshipped. Antichrist comes to kill or destroy. Of course, that's his reception. He's supposed to be worshipped, but he's not. We're not supposed to worship. I'm not saying that. Antichrist comes to kill or destroy, and also Antichrist will be tormented in hell. So that's it. So I hope you did well on it. If you have any questions, we can talk afterward about it. If you have uh, some questions about that, love to talk with you about it. But right now, we're going to get into our last, our part two of part one. We talked last week about more about the the what of spiritual warfare and and how it how it affects us as believers, and also a little bit about how it affects unbelievers, because spiritual warfare really um, is about power, but it's also about deceiving people who are looking for the Savior or um, wanting to know more about the Savior. He likes to deceive those people, and I was deceived for many years myself, and uh, so spiritual warfare is really about power, which we'll talk about in a little while. Right now, I'd like to turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to read from verse 10 um, to the end of chapter 6, and I'd like you to follow along with me. So I'll give you a second to get there. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the, in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me that our utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in Christ, in chains, that, it, that in it I may boldly speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul is giving us the groundwork of spiritual warfare and how we, how we should approach it, and he's given us our weapons that we're supposed to use for spiritual warfare, and he's uh, trying to give us an understanding of how we do battle with our enemy, which is Satan himself. So spiritual warfare, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist the devil. Resist the devil. And I like this statement from the book. I don't know if you ever, if you want to get this book, it's really good about spiritual warfare. It's from Max Anders. But he has lots of books out there on different things, but this one's on spiritual warfare. He says, warfare is also diplomacy, espionage, negotiations, and maneuver behind the scenes. 
which at times can have a greater impact on the outcome than the fighting on the battlefront. Because after all, what's really at stake is power. Satan wants to be God. That's why we're all in this mess. Satan wanted to be God, so God threw him to the earth, and he caused um, Adam and Eve to sin, and that's where we are right now. We're, we have a sin problem, and Satan wants the power over us. And he, wants, he has the power right now, but that will be soon be taken away from him. So our objectives here today is to gain a fundamental understanding of spiritual warfare. Okay? To continue the growth of the individual and the body of Christ in the ministry of intercessors and prayer warriors. And I will tell you a lot about spiritual warfare is prayer. Praying. Praying uh, um, on our knees. Fasting in prayer. Um, everything about talking to God from his word gives us the power that we need to battle spiritual warfare. How to win the battle without losing the war. So that's the things we're going to be looking at today. The course outline is our final one. It will be Scripture Foundation, Spiritual Warfare, Old and New Testaments, Jesus Christ, the model, Spiritual Warrior, Pitfalls to Avoid the Enemy and His Works, Preparing for Battle, Christian Weaponry, and we're going to go through the armor of God one by one. There's six of them. Our Scripture Foundation is Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 20. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. It's a battle we don't see, and it's going on right now. It's going on right now. So spiritual warfare in the Old and New Testaments, in the Old, of course, the fall of Lucifer. You can read that on Isaiah 14. Genesis 3.15, who can tell me what that one is? What is Genesis 3.15 talking about? Crushing the serpent's head, right? That was the war that Jesus took care of already. So Revelation chapter 12, the war in heaven, which is going to be happening in Armageddon. And uh, lots of bad things going to be happening at that time. But God is in control, amen? 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, war in man's heart. We have a war going on in our heart. In 1 Peter 5, 8, the enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion, waiting for someone to devour and he does that 24-7. Jesus Christ, the model spiritual warrior, he was tempted in the desert. And how did Jesus take care of that one? Scripture. He used the Word of God. And Mark, the power over evil spirits, um, he casted out demons all the time out of people. And uh, so he had power over that. Um, he was the spiritual warrior. Matthew 16, he rebuked Satan. In Luke, he prayed for Peter. And Matthew, he was tempted in the garden to give it all up and not my will but yours be done. And then he was tempted in his arrest, tempted at his crucifixion, and he empowered, bless you, empowered disciples over evil spirits. So Jesus was the model spiritual warrior. And if we want to follow anyone in the Bible of how to handle spiritual battles, it's Jesus Christ. So... Um, so we're going to get into some of this, and you should be going through your sheets right now. Um, in spiritual warfare, this is important to remember, God does the work of God. Right? Man does the work of man. We can only do what we can do in the flesh. We, we, are, we don't have the power ourselves to do this battle. Man cannot do the work of God. It's impossible. And God will not do the work of man. He has something for us to do, each, each and every one of us. And he, he is entrusting us to do that, to carry out. And the angels are flabbergasted by all that. They're like, hmm, wow, God's going to entrust man to do some of his stuff. So, but, but anyway, so we have to remember who's, who's in control and who has the power, basically, that, from that statement. God's work. Is spiritual warfare has to be done God's way. Okay? The work of humans is to learn and employ God's tactics and rely on God and God alone in the spiritual war. But for the life of us, however, we cannot get this straight, it seems like. And this is from Max Anders, a quote from his book. We insist on trying to do the work of God while neglecting the work of man. Then we wonder why things aren't going so well. So, very good point to remember. Pitfalls to avoid. Uh, denying the existence of evil spirits and Satan and taking on a realistic view of the world and man in it. 
we have to stick to the Bible, okay? And we just can't deny that these things are going on. We, we have to be aware of what's happening and, uh, and that there is a battle. Attributing all spiritual experiences to God, including forbidden territory. Everything is not from God. Angel, I mean, uh, Satan uh, shows himself to be an angel of light, okay? So it can look good on the outside, but watch out. Um, not everything is, because it might seem spiritual to you, is not from God. Not everything. Attributing most, if not all, evil and sin to Satan and demonic activity. We can't blame everything on Satan, as much as we'd like to. Some of it's on us, um, just because of our behavior, the way we act, our character. And uh, those are the things that God wants to humble us and change inside of us. And I can tell you, he has to do quite a work in me. This, one, this next slide you're going to find on your sheet, we're not going to go over it because I, I've been doing a study on this and I'm not quite done with it, so I don't really, I put this in there and I thought I would do it, but I'm not going to do it right now because I really don't have enough information on all this. So I'm going to ask you to just skip over that right now. We're not going to get into angels right now. But, but hear me on this though, angels do have a part in the spiritual battle and uh, I am doing a study on that. I want to really know what's, what's their part in this and a um, how, how does angels affect us as humans? Because they're in the Bible all over the place. And, and in fact, the book of Hebrews talks a lot about ministering spirits, which are angels. So I'm not going to get into that right now, but we're going to skip over that and move on to the next part, which is the enemy and his works. Okay, the enemy and his works. The works of Satan, witchcraft or sorcery. Has anybody in this room been involved with witchcraft or sorcery? I'm just, you don't have to if you don't want to, but if you want to raise your hand, go ahead. I just tell you, if you've been involved in that, um, there's extra work you're probably going to have to do, just to let you know. If you've been involved with witchcraft or sorcery or anything like that in your past, um, you will have to deal with that. It, it's, a, it's a different kind of a thing, but it's, it's very, very real. And if any of you don't believe, yeah, go ahead. I, I would throw that in there, yeah, mm -hmm. because they deal with a lot of that stuff. Uh, it, obviously, it's anti-God, okay? <laughs> really, really anti-God. And we have, uh, we have witches here in Sheboygan County, believe it or not. People don't believe that when I tell them that, but there are. There's lots of witches right here in our area. They're there. And, and they have a ministry that's against God. And so that's something that uh, we have to be aware of. Divination. What is divination? Well, it's talking to the dead, basically. Seance and mediums. I, I, I think I was driving down 14th Street. I saw somebody that uh, a sign that said, I read palms. You know, uh, stay away from stuff like that. That is not from God. That is totally, totally not from God. And then we have the cults. Uh, we have, the, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, New Age ideas, which uh, Barb just mentioned. Um, cults, are, cults are probably the most obvious thing you can see as a believer. Well, you should know that anyway. Uh, because knowing the Word of God and what they believe is totally opposite sometimes of what God... Some, some of it's the same, but then you get to one part and it's like, okay, they believe Jesus is not the Son of God? Okay, that should throw up a red flag. Um, all right. So then you have spiritualism, other religions, other than the cults that are... Um, I, I look at one that many Christians are getting involved in for exercise, yoga. That's a, that's a, a, a spirit-filled religion that's not of God. I'll just say that. So if you're doing that, I mean, I, I would say check into it for yourself. Get, get the right information. But, um, but there's other religions out there that Satan is using to deceive people. Remember, that's all what it's about. Is to, he wants power and he wants to deceive. That's basically his tactics. Okay? And where are the five points where he likes to attack? Well, he can't read our mind, but he can definitely affect our mind because he knows us. Um, if you've ever read really and studied the book of Job, he goes to God and he tells God, I can get at this guy. We, we can get at this guy, Job. We can do something to him. I, I know, I, I think I know him. And so Satan, that gives us a picture of Satan just doesn't um, prowl around just, you know, like... Uh, willy-nilly. He's got a plan, and he's focused on people. He knows you. 
He knows your dislikes, your likes, and just by watching you. Because this battle is going on. We can't see it, but it's there, okay? He affects your mind, your memory, your emotions, your intellect, your will, and your imagination. And he does that through the world, the flesh, and his demons, okay? And I know I've had talked with lots of Christians who don't like to talk about this stuff. Demons, come on, you know, get real, you know. Get with the times. This stuff is not happening. It is happening. And, and uh, a lot of those people, unfortunately, I don't see them around anymore today in the, in the Christian circles, um, just to be honest with you. Um, so we have uh, the, um, mind, emotions, intellect, will, and imagination. This is where Satan likes to attack. And this is a slide from last week. I'm just going to mention this again. In the center, you have the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Um, all this stuff is uh, coming at you from the outside in. Like I said, he can't read your mind. He can't make you do anything. Okay? He, do, he affects your will by giving you false information, and then you make wrong choices. Okay? Uh, but he can't, he can't touch you, really, because you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. So you've got power, more power than what you realize living inside of you as a believer in Jesus Christ. You have lots of power, and it comes from the Word of God, and it comes from the Holy Spirit living inside of you. It comes from knowing the truth, knowing the truth. So, but he, the flesh, he, he is, the body is what you see and feel, the soul is what you feel, what you cannot see, and the Spirit is what God first sees. Okay, And as a believer in Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us God sees Jesus now. He doesn't see you. He sees Jesus Christ. And amen for that. <clears throat> so preparing for battle. Excuse me, I've got to get some water here. Preparing for battle. Um, we're not going to go through all this. Some of these scriptures we will go through, but not going to go through all these. They're there for you. Because I expect, as believers, that we would go through this ourselves and study this. Because I'm not the authority here. God's word is. And... Uh, you, I mean, you're hearing me speak, but, you know, I can say wrong things. I can do wrong things. I'm, I'm still a sinner. And so you need to be diligent and look up the Word of God for yourself. Um, 1 Timothy 6-12, through 12, compete well for the faith. Actually, it says um, we're going to fight the good fight, right? We're not going to give up. Um, we're going to submit to God. We're going to resist evil. Uh, we're going to be steadfast in the faith. That means just constantly trudging through. We're going to be steadfast. Uh, we're going to have power. We have power in Jesus' name. The name of Jesus has lots of power. Ephesians 6.10 says, draw strength from the Lord. And Ephesians 3 says, power through the Holy Spirit. We have power in the Holy Spirit. And Ephesians, again, is a power for believers. And Luke 24, very important one, wait, wait on the Lord. If you're praying for someone for their salvation, don't give up. It's in God's timing, remember, and it's in God's power that the, that person is going to be saved. And uh, so don't give up praying for that person. Don't give up. Wait on the Lord. He's, he's going to do something. You just have to wait for, for him to do it in his time and his way. Okay, the Christian weaponry. Um, Christian wep weaponry. The name of Jesus, like we said, is, is powerful. Um, that's, yeah, go ahead. Right. In Jesus' name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree with you. Uh, and not only that, but quoting Scripture as you pray. You know, very, he doesn't like Scripture, <laughs> okay? He likes to twist it, make it say something it doesn't say, but he doesn't like Scripture. So if you're praying, yeah, pray in Jesus' name, but pray Scripture. You know, your words by itself doesn't mean anything to Satan. 
But if you have Jesus in there and you have the Word of God, now you've got power. Um, so the, and the next one is the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12, sharper than any two-edged sword, cuts to the very bone and marrow of the soul. So praying in the Spirit, okay? I wish we had time to dig more into that, but praying in the Spirit, what does that mean, okay? We are to be under the control of the Spirit. In Ephesians uh, 6.18, that's what that verse is actually saying, um, to be under the influence, not of alcohol, but under the control of the Spirit. So when we pray, are we praying in the Spirit? Or are we just flippantly saying prayers that, you know, doesn't really mean anything? Again, it comes down to the name of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Fasting and prayer, very, very um, awesome thing that we can do is fast and pray um, for situations in our life and for other people. Um, so that is our weaponry. <laughs> okay, again, it's, it's not going to be with swords and uh, guns and violence. It's done through the name of Jesus, the Word of God, the Spirit, and, you know, praying, praying. So, armor of God. Okay, now we're going to get into some nuts and bolts here of all this stuff. In Ephesians chapter 6 with the Apostle Paul, what was he talking about in all this? The armor of God, Ephesians 11 says, Put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now, when you read that verse, what does it tell you as a believer in Jesus Christ immediately? What's, what's it telling you? Yeah, but what is it given in action? It's telling you to do something, right? It's telling you to put on. Um, put on the armor of God. When these Roman soldiers went out to battle, they had certain pieces of armor on already, and they walked around the town like that or whatever what they, when they were in the jail cell. But when they went to battle, they put on other pieces of armor, which we're going to talk about wasn't always there for them. They had to put it on. They had to have it with them when they were going to go into battle. The same thing for us. That's the picture the Apostle Paul is giving the, the disciples of that day, and, and they get it. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, i got to put on the armor of God. Okay, what is the armor of God? That's what we're going to get into. Um, the armor of God is, is found in our scripture we just read this morning. It's the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes for the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Those are, that's our armor. And that's part of our weaponry as well. That's our armor that God wants us to have. And he gave it to us in full. We have it in full. We don't need anything else to do this battle. God has given us all the things we need to do battle. Um, uh, yeah, so I think I, I mentioned that. But I thought that was very interesting um, I did not know that. I thought uh, the Roman soldiers always had that stuff on, or they had when they put it all on, it was all on at once. But it wasn't like that. They, they had to put on this other stuff uh, when they went to battle. And, and that was the, the, uh, the shield, the helmet, and the sword. Those are the things, the three things that they had to put on. Okay, so the first one is the belt of truth. In Ephesians 6.14, it says, Stand fast with your loins girded in truth. The Roman soldier had this, um, I don't know what you would call it, like a, almost like a skirt, if you will, uh, but it was like very loose, okay? It was very loose so they could move well. But one, one of the problems was it, uh, it was kind of flimsy, okay? So if they didn't have something to hold it up and hold it in place, it would, it would get in the way of, of them fighting. So what they had is they had this belt that would come around and hold everything together, Okay? And that's really the picture Paul is giving us as believers. What holds us together is truth. Without truth, we don't really have anything. That's why Jesus said, I came to be truth. You know, I, I came to deliver truth. And then in, in, in John, or John 17, he says, I am the truth. I am the way. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, except through truth the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's word, that we were um, uh, created in his image, Genesis, male and female. All, that's, all that is being attacked, is it not? Even from the, from the get-go, the beginning of time is being challenged by everybody. 
trying to say that's not true. No, it is true. And we have to believe that as, as believers in Jesus Christ. We have to stand on that. Um, the belt holds everything up, and that's truth. And one thing to re- remember, God cannot lie. 1 Peter 2.22, Peter tells us in, in God's word. God cannot lie. God is always truth, always. The Lord is trustworthy, Psalm 145. You can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, can you not? I should get an amen. Yeah, you can trust Jesus Christ. He is Lord. He is Lord of all, all those who believe and trust in him. Jesus is truth, John 14, 6, the one I just quoted. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, Truth is, God is who he says he is. Do we know this? And do we believe it? Those are the things we have to ask ourselves. The other part is the attacks are going to come from lies, deception, and accusation. Lies, deception, and accusation. Discernment is needed, and I'm telling you right now, there's, that's a missing element in um, a lot of churches. Is there's not a lot of discernment going around. People are, are getting books they probably shouldn't get. They're into yoga. They're, they're doing things that is not, not really right in the sight of God. And, uh, and, and it, discernment is understanding, okay, what, what is the difference between light and darkness, between truth and deception, and love and fear. What does the Bible tell us about fear? Fear not, for I am with you. God doesn't want us to fear. And uh, we need to know the difference between good and evil. And that seems to be getting all mixed around as well. Um, so we have to be discerning. In 1 Corinthians 2.10, Ask the Holy Spirit who scrutinizes everything. Jesus tells us, I will send you a helper, the Holy Spirit who's going to guide us into all truth. And then Acts 16, follow the direction of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul followed the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit he knew was going to give him truth. And many other people were telling him, no, don't go there, don't go there, don't go here, don't go there. Did Paul listen to them? No. He listened to the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need to do. And we need to be so tied into the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God, through prayer, that we we not going to audibly hear God's voice, but you can hear God's voice in his word when you're reading it, and you understand it, and you're like, okay, Lord, I get that. I got it. God does want us to know these things. He doesn't want us to be ignorant. The breastplate of righteousness. Okay, the breastplate is the plate that goes over the chest, and what's in the chest area? Heart, lungs, vital organs. Okay? These, this was very important to protect the Roman soldier when he went, went into the field. And he did wear that all the time because he could be attacked at any time. So um, he kept his vital organs protected. And uh, the other thing we have to look at, we need to be clothed with righteousness as our breastplate. Jesus is our righteousness, right? Jesus Christ, first of all, in, in all of this, I, I should have said from the get-go is, you need to be a believer to, to be understanding all this. If you're an unbeliever, you're not going to get it. Um, and uh, you are in the battle, but, but you're, you're already losing the battle because you don't have Jesus Christ. And we have Jesus Christ, so he is our righteousness. We need to be clothed with him. So how do we get clothed? Well, we have to put on and take off things, as, as the Apostle Paul says in Colossians. Put on and take off. He's always giving that analogy. Put on and take off. Okay, what do you need to take off? Well, um, you need to take off stuff that God is pointing out to you, that sin and things that are getting in the way of your relationship with God because as believers in Jesus Christ, we're still sinners. We still sin, we still do the wrong things. We still get into the things we shouldn't get into. And uh, so we have to acknowledge that, humble ourselves in the sight of God and say, God, forgive me. Um, I I was wrong and uh, I want you to teach me the right way. That's our righteousness that we have in Christ. And some of us are being stripped of our righteousness. And we're allowing it to be stripped. And that shouldn't be. 
because we have every, um, as I said before, spiritual gift and um, every aspect of God that he wanted us to have, we have inside of us. And it's clothed with Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. The breastplate covers extremely important area, your heart. But not just physically. What is your heart also? Your soul. Um, the, the decisions that you make. Remember the, a slide from last week? The, the things that you do in your life um, should be righteous. Should be righteous. And if we don't understand what that is at times in our life, we need to go to the Word of God. Again, it's all about the Word of God. <laughs> I mean, this book is incredible. And if we apply these things to our life, you, you will see fruit that you've never seen before. But we have to do it. We have to do it. So that's an important area of the heart. Matthew says, blessed are the clean or pure of heart. Pure of heart. And we're pure, yes. We're pure because of Jesus Christ. Don't get me wrong. We are pure. We are righteous 100% because of him. But we still have to live on this earth until Jesus comes, right? Until, we, until, Jesus, until he tarries, until he comes. We have to deal with this sin problem yet that we have on, um, on this earth. And so that's the battle. Paul said in chapter 7 of, of uh, Romans, I do things that I don't want to do, and I, 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 I don't do things that I'm, I should be doing. Okay? He has this struggle. He, he's he's ex, um, expressing this battle inside of him. And, but we, sh we should have a pure and a clean heart. I mean... Not going to be perfect, okay, because until we get to heaven, we're not going to be perfect. But we should be striving for holiness. We should be striving for holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Ephesians 1.4 says, chosen to be holy and without blemish. When we speak of hearts, we think of love. We are to love righteous living. And I love what a statement a friend of mine told me years ago, a pastor friend of mine. He says, we must learn to love the rebuke of God's word. You must learn to love the rebuke of God's Word. If you're reading God's Word and it rebukes you, say amen. Hallelujah. But I'm sorry if some, some, some people get their backs up and, uh, and they go, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't believe that. Or whatever it is. But we need to learn to love the rebuke of God's Word. He's trying to change us. I, uh, he must increase, I must decrease uh, John said in John 3.30. Our desire must be to have our heart right with God. We can still be believers and have our heart not right with God because of sin. Or because of things we're doing. Or not doing. Um, 1 John 4.10 says, Jesus is our righteousness with God. Jesus is our righteousness with God. And there's no other stronger element than that when we have the truth and we have righteousness. Um, righteous, righteous person assured of victory. We are assured of victory. We're going to win. The Bible tells us that. Okay, We have the victory. Run the good race, the Apostle Paul said, right? Run the, run the race with endurance. Don't give up. Keep fighting. Fight the good fight. All those statements are action statements that we need to be doing in our life to fight the battle that's going on around us and inside of us. Um, so the attacks are evil and sinful desires, okay? These are the attacks that come to us as believers. Pride, big one, pride. Self-righteousness, false or showy piety. And pride, I'll tell you, God worked on me for years about with, with pride and things that I didn't think was pride, and he's still working on me to, to this day. But I've learned some awesome lessons about humility, that humility has power. Being humble before God, walk humbly with your God, that has power. And Satan doesn't like that when you walk humbly with your God. He does not like that. He wants you to be prideful like, he, like him himself, which sent him to the earth, and now he's under penalty because of that. So we have to remember, we have truth, we have righteousness, we have the shoes of the gospel of peace, and this is awesome. Shoes of the gospel of peace. Now, when I first read this, I thought, okay, he's talking about um, this gospel that we must put on or, or take off or whatever, but that's not what he's talking about. These are shoes he wore all the time, okay? He took them wherever he went. He had to wear shoes or sandals or whatever they wore. 
okay, boot. I think they were like, they, were, they looked like sandals, but they had a, a leather that came up to their, up to here, okay, it was like a boot, kind of like. But they wore those all the time, why? Because they had to keep their feet good. And they had spikes, I, I didn't know this, but they had spikes through the bottom of those uh, shoes as well, so that they could stand firm when they were, were going to fight. And so, um, these, this gospel of peace keeps us firmly rooted. We have the gospel of peace in that uh, it says, and your feet shod in readiness for the gospel of peace. Shod means put on, like strapped on. And uh, it, they're there. They're not coming off. They're, they're there. They're not going to come off. And uh, the readiness of the gospel of peace. We need to be ready to share the gospel at any time. In and out of season. Um, Ephesians uh, 6.15, and your feet shod in readiness of the gospel of peace. 2 Timothy 4.2, proclaim the word, be persistent, don't give up. Don't give up on somebody because just because they said no the first time or, or you haven't gotten together with them yet, don't give up. Be persistent with the word of God, with, with, with people you're trying to, even people, your other believers you're trying to disciple. Um, don't give up. Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. We have the gospel, and because we have the gospel, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I like that fact, that I am not at odds with God anymore. I, I have peace in my life today. I really like that. And God gives us that. And we need to be showing that to other people and giving it to other people. Don't hoard it all for yourself. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, The Spirit of, Lo the, Spirit of the Lord is now upon me. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had that um, 30 years ago if I wouldn't have saw Jesus and accepted him in my heart and he changed me from the inside out. And now the Spirit of the Lord, I can say, is upon me. In 1 John 1, 3, we, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim and turn to you. And I, and I know in my life I've seen a lot of things, I've heard a lot of things, but the gospel is probably the best thing I've ever heard in my life best thing I've ever heard. And so that's what we need to give to other people. Give them the best thing you've, you've ever heard, which is the gospel. Um, Go therefore to all the nations. Of course, we all know that verse, those verses. Baptizing them, teaching, teaching them everything about Jesus, everything about him and his word. So we have the gospel of peace. We also have the shield of faith. The shield of faith. Um, in uh, Hebrews 11, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Ephesians 6.16 says, In all circumstances, hold faith up before you as your shield. We have the breastplate of righteousness. We have the truth. We have the gospel of peace. And we have all of it because we have faith. We place our faith in this Bible in God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, was buried. On the third day, he rose again, according to the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we have the shield of faith that we need to put up. And this is, this is part of the armor that they had to put on. The shield. They had to, well, they didn't put it on, but they had to have it in their arm. I'm sure they had to strap or something that they had to put on their arm to block the arrows, to block all the, um, the things that were coming at them, rocks, whatever they're throwing at them. So they had to, they had to put that on. Okay, that's one of the pieces of armor they had to put on. So we, at times, we have to put on faith. Right? You have to say to yourself, I'm going to believe that. I believe and trust in that right now. I believe that God's going to heal me. I believe that God is going to find me a job in a couple of weeks. I believe that God's going to take care of that. So I'm trusting in him. I have my faith. We all have to do that at times. So we have to put it on. Faith is the full shield to cover the entire person. So the shield was big. I mean, it wasn't just, it covered the whole, whole body. So they had the breastplate of righteousness. They had the shield, okay? They had the spikes going through their feet to hold them in place. So they had, they, they had, they had it ready to go, man. They were ready to go for battle. And that, are we ready? Are we ready for the fiery darts of, the, of Satan who wants to take us out 
if he can't kill us, he wants to ruin our testimony. He wants to ruin uh, anything that we might say about God. And if you look around the world and you look in the past or now even nowadays, you can see many preachers, people of God, were taken out by Satan because their testimony was all of a sudden splat. And it's no good anymore. And uh, so that's what he wants. That's what he wants to do. Don't be ignorant about that. Receive supernatural gifts of faith. Um, born again. You're born again. You have all the gifts, as I just said before. You have all the gifts. And, uh, and God is not leaving us without the armor. He's given us everything we need. Um, a natural person does not have that kind of faith. Okay, They just don't. And that's why when people ask you to pray for them, they, they're seeing something in you that they don't have. So take that as an opportunity. I, I've had that happen to me. I'm praying for someone and at work, and all of a sudden this guy comes up to me and says, hey, I'm having some trouble. I, I noticed that you're kind of like a follower of God or something. I, I just want to ask you if you could pray for me. I'm having trouble in my marriage right now. Yeah, I can pray for you. What an open door, you know. Um, and I have to be honest with you, some, sometimes I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't take to that open door. i just be honest with you. I fell. I, I, I didn't do it. So at times we, we can fall, but we have to get back up and keep going. Okay, we have to fight. Um, trust God by faith, not by sight. Okay. Oh, I missed one there. Faith is realization of what is hoped for and evidence of things not seen. We're not always going to see God working all the time. It's usually after the fact. Sometimes we look back and go, oh, I saw God. I saw how God did that. Wow. But sometimes we're not going to see it. So we just have to trust and believe that it's going to happen. We're going to have faith in that. That's called divine assurance. Divine assurance that God is not going to let go of you. What, John 10, 28, what does it say? No one, no one is able to snatch you out of my hand. So you, you have it. You have God's promises in God's word for that. Trusting in God's strength is goodness other than our own. Um, here's the attacks. You're going to come out with doubt. Doubt is going to creep in. Uncertainty, fear. I'm sure we had a lot of that last year, right? Anxiety, disobedience, worry. What's going to happen? Oh. And, um, and, and folks, all of us can go through that. Okay, I'm not saying you're a bad Christian because you had this stuff. I have it. We all have it. But we have to recognize for what it is and do battle. Put up the shield of faith. Put it on. Um, put on the breastplate of righteousness. You are clean before God because of Christ. You have the truth of God's word. Okay? You have everything that God wanted you to have. So remember that. And you can get back up again and you can go again. Okay? You don't have to lay down and be beaten. You can get up and fight again. Fight the good fight, right? Um, and pray for faith. You can pray for faith. Okay? And come on Tuesday nights at 6 o'clock in this other room with us and pray with us. You can pray for faith. Lord, increase my faith. Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. And what did, what did Jesus do for that man? Healed his son. So we can pray for faith. Trials in life provide opportunity to grow in faith. Trials in life provide opportunity to grow in faith. Read the book of James. Trials are there for us to hone us, to make us sharper, to draw us closer to Christ, to be more like him. Um, so don't, don't look at trials as some drudgery. Or like, oh, They're there for us to help us to grow in our faith. Hebrews 13.5, I will never leave you or abandon you. And how many promises do we hear from God's word like that? I will never leave you. Never, ever, ever leave you. And we have that as promise. The helmet of salvation. Wow. And I'll... Just a reminder, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the saved here. Okay, he's not speaking to unbelievers. He's speaking to us. So he's not referring to, that's how, we, that's how we attain salvation, the helmet of salvation. That's not what he's talking about. Um, Ephesians six seventeen. take the helmet of salvation. So here's another thing that they had to put on. Okay, They had to take with them their helmet. They had to put on their helmet. They're going to battle. The battlefield is our mind. Okay, 
Up here, up here is where it usually starts, okay? Especially for men. Especially with pornography, with looking at other things they shouldn't be looking at. Um, it starts in your mind. Um, for a lot of women, it's worry, it's fear, it's anxiety, insecurity. Um, and that usually is because us as men, we're not being spiritual leaders like we're supposed to be, um, quite frankly. So the battlefield is our mind. It all starts there. Thoughts, decisions, and actions. James 1, 14, and 15. Have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 16. I'm get going here and close here in a few minutes, but we have a few more things to go through. Acts 15, 28. Invite the Holy Spirit into our thoughts and decisions. <laughs> that should be quite obvious, right? Um, we have the Holy Spirit living inside us, but guess what? The Holy Spirit wants us to have a relationship with him too. I don't know if you realize this or not, but the Holy Spirit is an actual person of the Trinity. Okay? Not, not like we are, but spirit. But he's there. Okay? He wants to have a relationship with you. We should be talking. To, now, I'm not saying you stand in line at the grocery store and you're talking to the Holy Spirit. But uh, if you want to do that, that's fine. Um, but uh, we, sh we should be inviting the Holy Spirit to come into our life, and, and especially when we're having uh, indecisions about things. Okay, praying, looking at the Word of God. That's where the Holy Spirit um, gets His stuff from. He gets it from God, from the whole, from the Word of God. And when we pray, when we pray to God, so John fifteen five. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Jesus couldn't do anything without the Father. So how do we think we can do anything without Jesus? We can't. Romans uh, twelve two. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but tr be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I'm going to go a little faster because I want to get to the end part here. But John 5, 5, 19, be totally dependent on the Father. Totally dependent on God. The attacks are fear, despair, discouragement, depression, unforgiveness, calamity, and, and accidents. Accidents can happen, but uh, it's what we do with them afterwards. 2 Corinthians 11, 24, and 27, hin Satan hinders Paul's work. So he's always going to be, if you're in ministry and you're doing things for the Lord, be on guard, he's going to be attacking you. He's been attacking me ever since I said yes to doing this. He's, 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 he's relentless because he doesn't want this stuff to get out there. And uh, so remember that. Um, the sword of the spirits, our last one, this one they had to take with them. They had to have their sword. <laughs> Not, hard to do battle without your sword. And sometimes we go into battle without the word of God. And we don't have the sword. We need to have the sword. We need to have, be ready with it. Ephesians 6.17, take the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. And John 1 and 2, the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Scripture is the Word of God, and we can't let that slide. Because there are seminaries out there who are teaching that God's Word is not inerrant anymore. That there's, fat, there's, there's stuff wrong with it, in other words. It's not totally accurate. That is not true. That is so untrue. And we need to refute that because this is God's Word. He gave it to us. We believe it. We trust in it as believers in Jesus Christ. And so we have to take that sword very, very, very seriously. Hebrews 4.12, through the Holy Spirit, the Word in Scripture becomes alive, active, dynamic, and effective. In 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching for rebuking, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that one who belongs to God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So if you want to be uh, doing things for God and you're, you're going to see fruit, this is what you do right here. Scripture. And get corrected, get training in righteousness. Isaiah 55, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall do my will, achieving the end for which I sent it. God's word will come to fruition all the way through, as we just heard about this morning, with Jesus riding in on that donkey. And the, the prophecies that were laid back then, there's prophecies for the future that have not yet happened. They are going to happen. They will happen. God's, God's word will not go void. So we have, we have the breastplate of righteousness. We have the truth. We have the... Um, Shoes, the gospel of grace, and uh, we have um, faith, the shield of faith, we have the sword of the spirit, 
We have everything that God wanted us to have, um, but we need to know this, okay? The Bible is central to the Christian life. This is a quote from Max Anders from his book again. But most Christians do not know it well enough to apply it specifically to all the challenges and temptations of life. If Jesus, in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, wielded the scriptures very specifically to defeat the wiles of the devil in his life, so must we. Knowledge of the scriptures is of paramount importance to our being victorious Christians, and we must commit ourselves to learning God's word well enough to be effective in spiritual combat. I hope that rings in your heart. On your sheet, it's not on the slides, but on your sheet, um, I'm just going to close with this. You'll have, there's a, a chart there. It shows you the weapon, it shows you the training, it shows you the warfare, and it gives you the victory in there. And uh, I thought that would be a little helpful thing for us to remember. Let's close with Paul's prayer from Ephesians chapter 3. I'm just going to read it verbatim, but I'm going to close with this. Heavenly Father, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed the, the series and hope to be back soon sometime. And I'd like to teach on the history and authenticity of the Bible if I get a chance to. I would love to do that. So, But thanks for being here. Have a good rest of the day.